evening, everyone. You're at Boston's most intense underground dwelling. It's that subterranean cavern of lurid vice and glamour. Before we we were like walking to the stage, the boom boom band, and uh, people were clapping. It's like, wow, we haven't even played a note yet. Wow, this is like we were feeling some love here. That's what it felt like. It's like, holy shit! And I don't think that that feeling ever really kind of got duplicated. I mean, I've had great nights all over the world. All my uh, rock and roll dreams came true there. You know, it's like all of that any kind of fantasy that you could ever have. It all happened there. I mean, that was the place. It's like, this is the place of stars. This is the place of the future. This is the place of talent way beyond my scope. I held this place like the Grand old Opry. I, I thought it was, you know, to eventually play there was almost uh, being, you know, knighted or something. The winning of the Battle of Bands there. I mean, that's a knockdown, drag out fight between another unbelievably great band, La Peste. It was a hard fought battle, and, and it was literally just every ounce of sweat and blood you could put into that night uh, and just hope you won. And winning it just seemed like, wow, you know, uh, if I died today, I've done everything I could ever dream of. You felt like a rock star if you were on stage, even if there were only three people in the audience. You know, you really felt like a rock star. The very first thing we saw before even going into the club was a person lying on the sidewalk. And we honestly thought that they were dead. They had that, uh, that the eyes were open, the waxy look about the face, you know, all that stuff. Uh, there was a car lot. And, you know, being a good citizen, I couldn't leave the guy just, you know, laying there. So we had the guy call the cops. The cops came, and uh, he wasn't dead. He was dead drunk. He'd been drinking, like, uh, Sterno or something horrible like that. So that was uh, uh, my first uh, excursion to the rat before even stepping foot into the building. Uh, and it was just a blast. And I can remember going down into the rat for the first time, and that's like an experience. When I mean, people talk about the rat, I mean, you had to actually go down these narrow stairs. Dark stairs with dark, dark. Little, little lighting, dark uh, carpeting. Yeah. It was dark. And <laughs> at the bottom would be the door with this roar coming out of it, you know, the group, but muffled roar. And as you get down, the roar would get louder and get louder, and it's, you know, to be the cigarette machine and the uh, popcorn machine was maybe there to the right, whatever. But it was like, you know, everything was missing except that thing over the top, you know, abandoned hope all he went to hit. <laughs> it was a sort of a dramatic entrance. And it was like a worthy entrance, right? Because the punk was nasty and snarling and dark and every everything that the rat was. It was like a perfect match. About 76, maybe, 77, first little uh, trip into Boston to see DMZ and it shattered my world. Not only was the whole scene scary to me, I mean, literally in these dark, sort of sweaty, uh, slightly sour smelling, you know, cavernous room, uh, but the band on stage, you know, uh, Mono Man and, and uh, company, it was a defining moment for me to, you know, see this unbelievable aggressive rock just, you know, literally threatening me and all that I stood for and what I understood about music at the time. And it, it shook me to my core. Uh, so not only was I 
you know, 17, being in a club I wasn't supposed to be in with all these freaky looking people, but the music itself uh, coming off that stage was, it just ripped my head off and completely, I mean, it was shocking and also titillating at the same time. And I knew from that point on that, that everything I knew was wrong, <laughs> so to speak, you know, that I had to really re-educate myself on what my priorities were as a so-called musician. The first night that we played there, even though there were good things that came out of it, having this feeling like, maybe this isn't, isn't really our town, you know, like, are we gonna fit here? It was our first gig and we, you know, coming, coming from Ohio and even though it was a Monday night, the, the, the ground level, of, you know, the, the bar level, you know, when you're walking off the street and you walk right into the bar, you know, that was full, you know, basically of guys and women in black leather jackets, you know, smoking, you could smoke in the clubs at the time, you know, there was always a club smoke, you know, at the Rad. And, you know, there's probably like Jonathan Richmond playing on the, on the jukebox, and everybody kind of had this attitude. You know, and rock and roll is very cool, but it took us a while to, to feel welcome, I guess. I, I wanted to walk in the door and have, have people go, yes, you made it, you're free, you know? And it was kind of like, you know, who the F are you? It took a while to kind of feel at home, so it was that, that, that first inclination that, oh, you know, this might be a little harder than we thought. A prep school friend of mine named Eric Lindgren, who's now known as the, the head of Off Off Records, had a, a, what we were calling a punk band, the stylistically they went punk, but we knew more of the term, a punk band that was rehearsing in his living room, and they would become the Atlantics. I think at this point they might have already chosen that name. This was, I think, um, February of 76, and we read in the paper that television was playing at some, you know, some place in town. So we all got in a van and we drive and we arrive at this completely boarded up building with no sign of any gig whatsoever. But we were all psyched to hear music. And so just on the way back, we're driving through Kenmore Square and like B says, oh, the rap, they have like punk rock there, which they did, but not on every night. Because I guess that, because at that point, Mickey Clean was playing there, but it wasn't on every night. So we park and we go in and we go downstairs, there's some horrible cover band, you know, I actually remember, they might have been playing original material, but it was sort of like Grateful Dead's, it was not punk. And we were, we were crushed, because um, we had been really psyched to go see some of this new music. very first time at the Rat was pretty illuminating, you know, because going to the Rat on the first night in Boston, when I already had in my mind that, that Boston was a really great place for music, I already had very clearly in my mind that going into town, this is exciting, I can feel the energy, I can feel the vibe of the town, and then you go to the Rat and you can feel the vibe of the club, and and it was just great. Right away, I just went, this is a great band and a great club and a great town. This is where I should be. This is, you know, what is wrong with what I'm doing right now is that I am not here. And within three days of that vacation, uh, we started looking for an apartment and moved to Boston, uh, largely based on that experience. Thank you and goodbye to me.
Back in the late 60s, uh, beginning of the 70s, basically there were two bands in town that were part of what I would call the scene. And it was the Modern Lovers and the Sidewinders. When the rap finally did come along, there was already a bunch of people that were like hanging around each other. I don't know how else to describe it. There was a, a scene looking for a place to land. Things changed at the time of the cars, of course. The line was down the, the block, the runaway place, the line was down the block. The minute punk hit, yeah. they was ready. Because Boston was ready, because we had the radio station, the MIT radio station, the ERS, and we had, uh, we called the magazines, at Boston Ruby News and Boston Rockway. A lot of things were in place and ready when punk hit big. So we did have a scene, rather than just like a scattering of groups or something like that. Well, it's very important that we had the rat. And you can see it today, because I read a lot of punk, uh, like I was reading the Encyclopedia of Punk, this huge thing, the size, three times the size of the Bible, and in there, there's mentioned two or three Boston punk groups, a DYS and uh, the Boss Tones, or the Dropkick Murphys, and that's it. But they do mention the rap. And when you read all these histories of punk and stuff, they barely mention any of the, especially the earlier groups that we had, but they always will mention the rap because the rap was the scene, and that's what we had, that's why it was important. And, you know, to have a scene, you have to have that, the, the culture, the art, which in this case is all the music, and you have to have, you know, that symbiosis between radio, you know, TV, if you can, and the media, in which would be the magazines, and the clubs, which we had that. And when every, as time has gone by, the thing that sort of stands there, even, sometimes over the music is the club, and that's sort of surprising. It's the rap. The rap became the symbol for everything that we did. You know, what a surprise. That wasn't predicted. I mean, because my focus was always on music. It's the groups, it's Willie. It's, you know, it's this group, that group. And I always thought that's the most important thing. But in retrospect, the symbol for Boston punk is the rap. Yeah. That's what people remember. That's what it's become. If you read the literature now, when people look back, you talk about the rap. If you go on the internet now, there's all this stuff about the rap. So it's very, very important. I mean, I wouldn't have guessed it at the time, but there it is. Well, you know, also because there were other clubs that, that sprouted yeah. up and, and quickly went away, and the rat stayed. Yeah. So it was always there. Everybody kind of knew each other. Everybody kind of, the bands were friendly. Everybody was into this, this scene. You couldn't really describe it. It was just a bunch of musicians, a bunch of this, a bunch of that. You know, all in this place. I mean, you can't just say the rap because it was the whole scene. Right. But the rap was the center yeah. of the scene. You know, you, you thought of the scene first, but then you said, but but uh, but the fact of the matter is that that you know more often than not, that thing that was the scene was at the rap. Hey. We well, had a lot of papers at the time, sweet potato. Uh, you know, all these papers that were supporting the scene. Yes. Yeah. WBCN, BOS, COZ, AAF, all played local bands, you know, maybe only at certain times of the week or day, but they played, you know, they would play. And talked about And talked about them. So it was, it was sort of a, a perfect storm of supporting this scene, which I don't see a lot of out there now. <laughs> just felt right. It wasn't so much that the rat was better to play in than the channel or that it was better than Bun Ratties. It was just the scene at that time in Boston when 
was was so unique and so special and so alive. There was a vibrant electricity that you could not miss. You had Lansdowne Street, you had Spit and Metro at the time, right around the corner from the Rat. It was all about the scene. It's a well-supported scene. A lot of people don't want to be friendly nowadays to other bands and help other groups to get a leg up because it's very dog-eat-dog. -dog. And you did not have that in Boston at all. What you had in Boston was a real feeling that if everybody else is doing well, then I'm doing well. And it didn't hurt when people saw scenes like Seattle scene where you go, wow, if one guy, one band breaks through, Nirvana breaks through, and look all the bands they bring with them. Yep. You know, and all of a sudden, all these other Seattle bands start cropping up. Uh, and Boston had a good feel for that as well. People wanted to play together and work together, and that's what helps to make it special. Then you have more clubs open, you have more people are able to play, and it starts working its way up. Nowadays, it's the opposite, and it's working its way down, and clubs are closing. There was a little community of the people who write about the scene. Um, the first person to write about the scene, I think, was Bill Tupper. But Bill would show up in different places. And then you had the people writing for their college papers. Um, and it was James Isaacs who was writing for the Phoenix. But I think actually thought there was Bill James and Liz Island for the BU paper and me for the, for the Harvard paper. And then, and then of course, more, more people started showing up. Bob and I had met at this Willie Alexander Fox Pass Atlantic show at Tufts. And I told Bob that I was writing about the scene for the Harvard paper. And then Bob decides that he'll start a fanzine. There were some little fanzines at the time. Uh, I think Boston Grouping is it started. Mm -hmm. uh, Dirt Magazine, uh, which featured some of the early work of uh, the photographer Mark Morrison. Uh, and then there was a, let's see, miscarriage. Most of these were Maybe even mimeographed, I'm not sure, or, or typed on a typewriter and photocopy. Mm. And they reflected the excitement of the scene, but I, I wanted to start something with a little, a little more in-depth uh, approach. Not knowing anything about, about the magazine business, I decided I would, I would produce a, a printed magazine. Uh, a real magazine? Yes. Uh, and I got, so I got somebody who could write really long articles. <laughs> Me! <laughs> to basically write the whole issue. Uh, and we had uh, uh, photographer Denise Donahue, uh, who, who became Denise Rowe and is, is now dead. Mm -hmm. She did a, a photo shoot with Willie, with, with his first issue t-shirt. <laughs> they produced the all the type, and this was before desktop publishing, so we had to lay the type out on boards, and then we gave it to... Uh, Printing plant and you normally did newspapers. The cutting of these things, the, the DNA you're giving these pages, you need to, and they were sticky on the back, and you needed to cut them up and lay them down on boards. You have to lay out the magazine, decide, okay, what's going to go on page two? Bob was paranoid that we would have too much text to, for the plan length of the magazine, we ended up with too little. So we ended up inserting lots of white space. It was a very minimalist design. We had somebody who did, who did a nice logo, but uh, we didn't really have an art staff. There were other people trying to do what we were doing. Subway News was the first uh, tabloid uh, yeah. printed magazine that actually made it for a while. And then uh, there was Take It. They had Byron Foley. Yeah. And, and that was that was the great discovery there. Yeah. Uh, and Boston Rock, which, which was, oh, yeah. the, was, was the big long-term success. Yeah.
we're gonna take a break and make a phone call now. People would hang out together, you knew the other musicians, you were friends. There was a community, and I've always believed what's good for the community is good for the individual. And the rat was right in the middle of it. When you have a community that's supporting the club well, then the club in turn supports the community well. If you have a place where you can go see bands, where musicians go see other groups, not just whoever likes that group goes and sees them, but when it's when musicians come to see a band and then in turn the band who was playing goes to see the musicians who were in the audience, their audience, then you have a prosperous, thriving scene. And so I think it did both. I think that the rat helped to grow our audience because people would come to the rat just to come to the rat, then see us, and then go other places to see us, and in turn, they would our audience would come to see us at the rat because they liked us and discover the rat. set up bills together and, and you know you flyered, you made posters, it was all word of mouth and posters. Because like said, you, know, you didn't even ever weren't ever on the phone unless you were home to even get a call, which nobody ever was. The sense of a scene and a, 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 a being a clan, of being a tribe was really profound. And it was a tribe that, that I was proud to be part of. Because you had each other, you didn't have to worry about what society thought of you. There was like protection in the tribe, within the tribe. There was protection in the clan. You talk about the rat, you gotta talk about Kemwa Square. Because a lot of people when they talk about the early scene of the rat, they'll always, you'll always show the uh, Sitco sign. The idea being it wasn't just the rat, it was that whole area, which was um, the pizza pad, the pizza pad, well, super salad later, strawberries, New, New England Music City across the street, and then later on Avalon and Spit down there, and then even Storyville. But that was a place like where punks would hang out, even during the day. It was that great wide sidewalk in front of the rat, with a bank of phones. And if you could go back in time, I'd love to hear the dialogue in those phones, those conversations. You know, boyfriend, girlfriend problems, band problems, drug deals. I mean, it would be great to hear those conversations. So there was that bank of phones. It was like a real, I don't know, just neat scene. Because a lot of times I think club. between sets, people would go upstairs, they would go upstairs and drink at the bar upstairs, or they'd go outside and hang out out front there, by the way. Yes, that was like a hangout before you had to go out. To and then after the club, everybody would go to the pizza pad, drunk yes. out of their minds, and <laughs> eat pizza. <laughs> and steal chicken and cornish hens off the thing. And the disco kids would come across the street from what was it Narcissus was at the club? Whatever. Celebration. 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 Yeah. And you glare at each other. They'd glare at each other. They'd be all you know dressed up in, in suits and ties and they'd be I wasn't. I would dress in my work clothes. But what my friends would all be, you know, in the regalia, we would be all decked out. And you just glare at each other. And I got beaten up, I mean most I got beaten up by a bunch of suburban disco kids at one point outside the rat. Um, Randy Black of Lumber Rays put it into a song that night. He used to have a, one of his songs he would do, he would do a, a spoken thing in the middle, and he went in that night, it was all about Eric Mann got beaten up! <laughs> Just walking down the street back then was a conflict, you know, every other corner. It just, you know, if you had a mohawk or pink hair or, you know, if you wore the uniform of the day, it was, it was not the easy way to go through the day. It was actually kind of tough. But that's that was our commitment at the time, you know. We identified with this so much. Uh, we, you know, we walked the walk, as they said. 
I got beat up a lot of times. When the bars got out, there was rumbles in the street. And when you think about it back then, people, things were new and people weren't tolerant. And uh, so you had the disco people fighting with the punk rockers, you had the Lansdowne Street, and it was crazy. It was a battlefield in those early days, right? It was, you could actually draw a battle map with punks on the rap side, the disco people on that Lucifer side, was also plugged in, yeah. Lucifer's and <laughs> Cadence, yeah, and that's, right. that, that's the way it's called. And, and also coming in in the pincer movement would be the jocks from the Fenway Park beating up everyone else in their path. Or something. Yeah. Pull the trigger! Pull the trigger! It was a place I can go to to again be myself and see see things I liked and not have to feel so you know for for one moment just knowing that I'm, I'm with people that uh, will understand me and just uh, I understand them and I think the sort of exclusiveness of of the fact that it was a small population it kind of makes it there's a certain brotherhood there of the people that went there. Being a part of something that everybody wasn't into, and that was fine by me, because I, I'm not like anybody else, and the rat wasn't like any other club. If you were cool, you were welcomed to the club instantly. It was a tight scene, but we were, but it was not closed tight scene. It was a very open tight scene, and, I, I, and, and that, I think, was important. You felt like you are in some kind of secret club that you know, you were so happy no one else was uh, in on this secret. You know, it was great that the rest of the world didn't even know about it. You felt kind of part of an elite, you know? Lizzie Bourne the Exodus was given a really hard time because when we started out, again, there weren't that many all-female bands and people didn't really know where to put us. They didn't know where to book us and we were actually picked on um, because we, we were kind of hard looking, very punked out, so we were called names and uh, given a pretty hard time. You know, the rap bouncers were famous for sometimes not doing the right thing. And we're on stage playing, the bouncers come up, a couple of them, and they start calling us all these names. Back then, and they would never do it now, they would call us like lesbians or dykes. So they started calling us these names, started squirting us in the eyes and face while we're playing. All I remember is jumping off stage and landing on one of the bouncers. Well, I start beating the bouncers with chairs. I had a weapon in my hand. Back then people didn't really carry guns, but I had a big knife. The knife was as big as I was. And I just remember going crazy on these bouncers that were huge and I weighed like 80 pounds. I just remember arms coming around my waist, pulling me off these bouncers and dragging me out the back to the parking lot and holding me down. I will never forget that night. It was just horrible. Jimmy Harold called me. He actually fired those guys like that. I was so happy that he did that. And it just shows what kind of guy he was. You know, we dealt with a lot of stuff like that. And it was very hurtful. What changed for Lizzie Horn and the Axes was when our video took off. In a way, the boys ruled the world, but, but I never felt mistreated, you know? You had to prove yourself, though. There for many years, uh, got my start there um, as a doorman. 
but it was like a very tight knit family, like a brother sisterly situation, you know, with all the hierarchy in place. And Jimmy was the, the big father, Hope was the mom that was the, the more, you know, feeling, nurturing mom, and she always took care of us, always looked out for us. Uh, we refer to as the Island Misfit Toys, a big dysfunctional fun family. The rapport that the staff had with the clientele was, uh, you know, never really seen to, you know, anything come really that close to it. You know, we, we, a fun thing we would do every year is we would take a busload of regulars and guys in bands and go to King Richard's Fair, which we renamed Keith Richard's Fair. Because the, the rule was you had to either bring a case of beer, a bottle of booze, or some kind of party favors. And Hope would organize the whole thing. And we would rent a school bus, we would come pick us up at the Rat, we'd drive out to Carver, and you know, you know, the bus would unload with, you know, with, you know, 25, you know, hot chicks and 25 dudes all with leather jackets on and take King Richard's Fair and go in there and pound drinks and just tear it up and have a good time. And we always did, like, social things like that. I mean, the place definitely had a, had a, a heart and a caring sensibility as far as um, every Christmas we do the food drive, you know, for uh, the Pine Street Inn. One of the things that was so special about working there was, um, we were in charge. I mean, Jimmy was your boss, but he was never around, really. And then Hank was only there during the day. Um, but we ran the show, and it wasn't the customer that was always right. You know, we were we were the ones that had the final say, and we were the ones that could be rude or fresh or stand up to people. You know, not take any any guff from people or any disrespect from people. And I guess that was a very empowering sensation. It was like if somebody was rude or somebody. And it was inappropriate or something, you could just say, no, I'd say they're going, no, they're out, you know. So there was a sense, tremendous sense of power and like being protected and looking out for each other. I learned a lot about, you know, holding my own, being strong, making money, being honest, uh, handling money, handling the cash business. You know, they were good teachers. I think. Uh, when you're talking about what made the, the rat unique, it was it goes back to Jim. This was somebody who genuinely really cared about the music and the quality of the music and realized that he was getting in on something that was developing and really took some huge financial risks to support that, like making the Live at the Rat album in 1977. I mean, Jim and I have talked about this and he spent well over $100,000 to produce that record. And when you think about dollars in the 70s, that's you know, a considerable amount of money. And he did it, you know, at his own peril. I mean, he was putting his own personal, uh, you know, like his house on the line and stuff like that. Um, CBGB's had already released a live at CBGB's album. And uh, I think the general consensus was, God, we got bands that are better than that. <laughs> and there was always that level of competition mixed into it. His album came out before mine, mine came out afterwards. Totally different types of albums. His was studio, mine was live. When uh, the Boston scene was cutting its teeth, New York and everybody else was doing the same thing. We had a live at CBGB's thing, of course we followed right behind them with a little live after rap. Our album kicked theirs to shit all over the place and everybody knows it. Jimmy said uh, he thought he'd give us a gig just because we were so bad, people would come down and, and laugh, you know. But uh, he was a, a club owner, he was trying to put, uh, you know, some money in the coffers. So, I mean, it wasn't about that he should like what you were doing, but he, yeah, he, gave, he gave people a chance to, to do what they were doing, and he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't complaining too much, but he, he would not mince words, you know, he said, you guys like are so bad that <laughs> people are going to come down and, and laugh at you, you know. So, but you know, after all, they weren't laughing. Anymore. We allowed everybody to do their thing in the club. Jim Harold, uh, you know, supporting all this stuff, you know, letting it happen almost in spite of himself is really a, a cool thing. You always need some figurehead like that. There was also a guy named Mitch who was the doorman most of the nights that we played there, who was older than the rest of us, um, but but very sweet guy. And I don't know if he had throat cancer or or what. 
you know, what had actually happened, but he used a little mechanical um, voice generator that he would hold against his, his throat. How are you doing today, Jerry? You know, and and he was he was always very sweet, and it was kind of nice to have somebody like him there who was a little calming presence, because. You know, sometimes people would come in off the street and maybe be a little drunk and, and, you know, even if they wouldn't want to hear ZZ Top, you know, they might have their own issue of whatever, you know, you know whatever it might be, you know, the Red Sox lost and they're having a bad night or whatever. So having, having somebody who was a little bit older, he kind of, you know, kind of made people calm down a little bit was always, always a very valuable thing. Mitch was a very special man. You know? uh, you could describe him as a, a second father. Or he just he stood out among among other men. Uh, yeah, that's good. He was a he was a natural force to be reckoned with or not reckoned with, however you wanted to play it. I got my ass kicked a couple of times, uh, at, you know, outside of the rat. Once uh, bad enough to send me to the hospital. You know, trying to defend my punk rock girlfriend who ran into some Southie disco. Brats and uh, next thing I know, a bottle to my head and about a pint of blood spilled out on the uh, sidewalk with Mitch, you know, telling me as I came out of uh, unconsciousness that the ambulance was on the way. Late in uh, B's second career, he kind of took a shine to me. And I kind of was kind of wondering why. And um, he said, Oh, you're a sax player, you should listen to my tapes. He said, Well, you gotta listen to my sax tapes. So he, like after hours, he put on these sax tapes. And he's a, he was an amazing saxophone player, awesome saxophone player, beautiful tone, great feel, um, jazz chops off the yin yang, amazing tapes. Um, but he got cancer and he couldn't play after that. It blew out his, uh, you know, because he had that buzzer. So he, I guess the windpipe couldn't take the pressure playing a horn. So he had to quit. So there's there's fucking Mitch down at the Rat, listening to these idiots banging on their guitars that they can barely play. And the cool thing is that he got to like it. <laughs> I think he did. Uh, well, there was talent eventually, in among the noise and bluster and confusion. The legendary Mitch would be the guy to, to hand over the money. In terms of bands, uh, he was really, really good to us. He, he was really complimentary towards the band. Uh, he was apologizing that there was you know, only X amount of money. Um, and it was really nice that, you know, it sounded like he'd been listening and that he could relate to, uh, you know, what it was like to play for Peanuts and still love it. When Mitch the, the, the doorman died, uh, there was one last big blast. Uh, and the thing I remember, uh, and this was, this was a really touching moment. Uh, I remember him in 1974, and I, you know, I played here in Boney Baroni, and he could talk back then. He was real friendly to me, and we're all here out of respect to his memory. All right? He was a great man. He's missed. He's missed. You know, Mitch played the saxophone, so it's real appropriate we got some saxophones up here for him tonight. Um, uh, so, uh, I don't know what we're going to do now. So maybe we'll play an old song for you. Play some old songs. We'll play this one. Butterfly in your right shoulder we didn't listen to cover bands. That's what this was. This was the escape from cover bands was to go to see original music. And again, that's the thing that that Jimmy Harrell talks about is that he decided I should have bands that play their own music play at my club. And, and people thought he was crazy to do that, but he thought it was an important issue. And he followed through on it, and it became a successful idea. But that's what we were escaping from, was all that Peter Frampton and all those horrible covers. And, and you know, bands, people wanted to see the, the famous people being covered by local bands. And we didn't want to see that, so we needed that music anyway. We wanted to see the original stuff. Like I said, I was clubbing during that time, and that was my experience. I'm out there clubbing, and sort of those those '60s bands were all dying, and what you were getting with the '70s bands, and there was that culture of cover bands. It's funny that that that's how things progressed. At that point, you go to be a band that do all the Who covers and Stone covers, and that that was the what it was like out there. There was a few pockets of originality. Duke and the Drivers were one of the Precursors of punk that were out there. Road Apples comes to mind. There'd be local bands playing their own music, but it wasn't much of a scene. 
until Jimmy Harrell. And what's funny is Jimmy had that vision. You know, it's funny you talk about the rav clubs and what's going on. I was just sort of following the music, but like Jimmy wasn't. Jimmy had the idea that let's have these people, even if they weren't the greatest musicians, Mickey Clean, they were sort of, you know, they were exciting in their way, and they actually had an audience. Jimmy says when he had them down there, he, he filled the club up good enough to make yeah. it worthwhile. You would think, who's listening to Mickey Clean in 1974? You know, who's li listening to even Willie Loco in 74, 75? People were, people were hungry for it. Jimmy knew it, that was a smart thing. He was there before punk, you gotta understand that too, Punk happened, say, the explosion of punk in 77. Jim was doing this before that, and a lot of the Boston groups were there in place before the Ramones, and before the Sex Pistols, so they don't sound quite as punky as them because they have their own thing going. They sound more like, you know, hotter rock for the day, like the, the Real Kids and the Boom Boom Band. They don't sound punk, per se. So it was that crossover time. Yeah, so Jim, Jimmy was there before punk, he was bringing in the punkier style groups, and when it broke, he was right there, and he took advantage of it. He worked it. He saw what Hilly Crystal was doing. He talked to Hilly Crystal, they went back and forth. And again, it's the idea that there's a business person there that sort of made the difference. I think the Rat Hat covered the whole range of the scene, stylistically. Um, other clubs tended to be the oddy end of it, or at the other extreme, Bun Ratties, which at, at earliest, you had no overlap in booking, and then later had some overlap. There was much more mainstream. Work. If you were forced to only go to one club, you'd go pick the rap because then you'd see everybody. The rap was such a maverick in and of itself. Um, Jim Harrell is a guy who wants to run things the way he wants to run things, and. Uh, you know, the fact that he didn't want to buy into uh, a big corporate, you know, uh, concept behind this place for whatever reasons, so who knows. Um, uh, I, I actually appreciated that. You know, they were always willing to take, you know, risks as far as bringing different bands in and bringing up and coming bands in. You know, and the thing was, you know, The Rat too, it was such an independent um, entity of its own. You know, you don't forget, you know, we had a fight tooth and nail with every other club to get good bands in there, you know, especially Lansdowne Street. If a band was breaking, you know, and starting to get big, you know, they could, you would get scooped up in a heartbeat, and, you know, they would just offer money that we just couldn't compete with. You know, the Talking Heads played there. Uh, the Ramones played there a bunch of times. U2 played one of their first shows in the States at The Rat. And the police, I know Jimmy was very instrumental in uh, bringing the police to the U.S. Uh, Hootie and the Blowfish, I remember getting the call from their manager. I'm saying we can't get a gig in Boston, we can't get a gig anywhere. Um, you know, will you, you know, will you at least consider it? Hootie and the Blowfish, second time around, played the balcony for 150 bucks. And then like two months later, they sold like three million records and they were gigantic. I seen the runaways there, that was like an event. Um, the Police was amazing, The Jam, I mean, I was a huge Jam fan, I couldn't believe I could go see The Jam at The Rat. On The Go-Go's, The Ramones, Television, Blondie. Ready Teddy, Nervous Eaters. Here we go, this is J.J. Rassler and Mono Man here, and they were GMZ. Uh-huh, Helen Wheels, not with us anymore. Frank Rowe did that, his baby's arm at the rat. That was the name Matthew and Mackenzie and I came up with when we were making up names for bands. Lori Dahl. Club, that was, you know, the club and the rat, those are the places. Bands like The Boys, The Real Kids, Third Rail, Ready Teddy, Fox Pass. Dick J. Giles band played uh, a surprise gig. <laughs> the Shirts, I remember them, television. The Neighborhoods, The Unattached, um, Classic Ruins, Del Fuegos, Willie Alexander was always a huge hero of mine, Robin Lane and the Chartbusters. The Real Kids, and The Nervous Eaters, and Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers. Luna and the Humans in the Neighborhoods, and say The Laughing Dogs from New York who used to come through. And again, The Heretics, 
Um, you know, the Fighting Cocks were a great band. Um, facts about rats, um, the Titanics, you know, Dogzilla, um, you know, Downchild, Seika. This one, uh, Boom Boom's Real Kids, Devo, Ramones, all these bands, everybody here played the rat. Everybody that came to town played the rat. No matter how big or small you were, you played the rat because the rat was where it was at. Cheetah Chrome and the Dead Boys played there. Um, and then you have all the great, you know, Boston bands, you know, that pass through there. You know, Cobalt 60, Chloe, my band Turbulent Daughters always did pretty well there. You know, Power Man 5000. I gave G Love and Special Sauce, like their first show ever in Boston. Made them, you know, pretty much regulars at the, at the bar for a while before they blew up huge. This is the Mindless Fox and the Inflictors. I played drums that night. Stephen Lovelace presents the Lovelace Lads. Yes. To Buffalo Tom, to Juliana Hatfield, Muddy Muddy Boston, that whole era of the Pixies, starting with the Pixies, really. Starting with the Pixies. Um, Floyd Muses, which were, were you know, as brilliant as anybody. Dinosaur Jr. DMC. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Zulus. Yeah, in fact, I met, I met um, Brian May and the drummer for Queen once because they came down to the Rat. Um, and uh, the Kinks would always come down to the Rat. Uh, Elvis sure Costello was. went down the Rat. After, these are after they played the Paradise, the other yeah, clubs. Or, they, or would, they would have to come down and check out the scene. I remember, Gordon, we saw it down there. I remember when I, when, uh, I met Brian May, uh, they were playing at the Garden. And he says, I said, oh, I never go to the garden because it just sounds like a bunch of noise there. He said, hey, what are you saying? We sound like noise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> in, the, in the dressing room of the rat, uh, behind, behind the main stage, it was, a, it was a big thing to sign your name on the wall if you ever played there. Like, walking into that dressing room, um, was amazing seeing like there would there would be bands that everybody heard that's like the police joan jet you know like like okay you know these people who played the rat you know and and there's you know sting signature on the wall or whatever but then there's like five thousand other bands and just seeing like the breadth and scope of the of the scene I didn't see it as a, a competition, uh, I saw it as an extension. You know, my wife actually lived in New York for a couple of years uh, during the, the you know, CBGB's uh, uh, dawn as well. You know, she was, she was absolutely right there when, and when all that just kind of started blowing up into its, you know, credible cultural zeitgeist too. And, uh, but, you know, some people always like to paint the Boston versus New York thing, you know, but um, we couldn't have done it. You know, the rap couldn't have made it without CBGBs. It was a part and parcel, you know, there was a, they needed each other, you know. Um, bands who could play at CBs and make a noise there, one of their first, you know, road trips would be to go to the rap and see if they could make it happen there as well. You know, CBGB's was getting a lot of press, and if you read about a band at CBGB's, you pretty much were guaranteed that they'd be up at the Rat at some point soon. And by the same token, CBGB's became, you know, for us Boston bands, the next, you know, place to go play and hopefully make a mark on, too. So I, I see them as very, very similar, you know, cut from the same cloth um, venues. Uh, their importance to everything that happened at that, at that time, they were tied together. And there was the trade, I mean, Cocking Heads and the Mumps and friends of ours from CBGBs would come up and stay with us and play the route and go back down, we'd go down there and we'd stay with them. And it was, so it was not only just a Boston scene, it was this um, pretty friendly association, brother-sister thing, CBGBs. It wasn't uh, New York is better, or Boston is cooler. Somehow or the other, I met Hilly. I remember going to his club, and I met him. And we're talking, and he and I 
we're talking about the same wavelength, about the same bands and things like that. And at that point, I was able to get Tough Darts and these mm. early New York bands. And it was just like, after three or four of them came, then it was just like, New York bands. I had, you know, New York bands at any time. And it was great. It was sort of like an exchange program. The New York bands had come to Boston and went over to New York and played in CBGBs. part about being at the Rat was you didn't necessarily have to be an accomplished musician musician to play there, you know. Uh, you just needed a, a, a dream, a couple of songs, and, and something electric to plug in and make noise, you know. <laughs> we saw so much stuff down there, it was, it was incredible. Uh, Elvis impersonators, we had drag shows for a while. It was kind of run for anybody in there at least once or twice. You know, I had some strippers do a show with us, and one of them wanted to sing in the blues, and she was, she was god-awful, but, you know, she sang a blues song, and we would back her up, you know, and she got off on it. This girl, Nancy, um, would start an this song about Judy Garland, and she'd sing some over the rainbow a cappella to start the song, and it'd be at the rap, and it'd be dead silent. And she would hold the microphone like, like she was stroking it. And after she finished, she'd be just flushed with pride and the sound of her voice. And one lone wolf in the crowd said, Suck on it! <laughs> and she said, God damn! <laughs> and I'll never forget that. So here I am crawling between people's legs and looking up. And meanwhile, the guy on the stage is tearing up a bear and his beer belly is all covered with sweat and there's shreds of stuff, bears, remnants <laughs> dripping down. And uh, yeah, it was great, you know. Uh, you could see that kind of thing at the Rat. It seemed to allow a vast uh, assortment of, of expressions of art. I mean, it was music, but, you know, it was more than music sometimes. It was performance art. It was, you know, nudity. It was sexual... Uh, bizarreness. It was uh, S&M on stage. It was, you know, gay and straight and bondage and, uh, and punk and puke and violence and blood and, you know, the Dead Kennedys. I remember that was a huge night. We played with the Dead Kennedys on their very first show in Boston and that was a big deal. I mean, the Dead Kennedys in Boston, you know, that had all these straights up in arms. I think there were 50 cops on because they the, thought there was going to be a riot. That you know, this, you know, that the city of Boston and their, you know, beloved, you know, Kennedy's son uh, could be besmirched in such a way that this outlandish right. band would dare come make this uh, disgraceful, you know, um, entrance into this hallowed ground on, on the streets of Boston and we played with them and it was an amazing night but there was talk of riots that night there was wow. just really police presence was huge uh, that band's energy was like you know insane I mean that was you just watched because you didn't know what was gonna happen next you know if people were gonna you know just if the whole building was gonna collapse it was that intense you know we had these great personalities like, uh, you know, whether they're transsexuals or, or um, 
just luminaries who uh, had completely debauched lifestyles, uh, but were extremely intelligent and very, you know, uh, picky about their rock and roll. We had, you know, April, uh, transvestite April, and we had Catwoman, who uh, we knew would um, uh, take unsuspecting um, boys home and uh, handcuff them and piss all over them and stuff. And we could just see that happening night after night, and we just thought, Oh, this is good. You know, that guy has no fucking idea what's going to be happening to him later. Or April, of course, you know, who could uh, look okay to, you know, the drunkest uh, guy looking to get laid. And, of course, you know, she's she's got a penis, and that's going to be a big surprise when they go home, too. We've been disappointed before. We've been disappointed before. We've been dis How do we define punk rock? You know, uh, if you start to take the style out, what are you left with? Well, I still think you're left with a very DIY, uh, self-expression. Um, you are allowed to say or do this any way you want, and uh, if it involves a little conflict, great. If it if it's just that you feel like singing upside down from a ladder, great. Um, uh, and I think ultimately uh, the lack of, of uh, money or the lack of, I'm doing this because I want to be rich, uh, was extremely liberating. And I think that's really, you know, I think I still weigh in on that a lot now. If I, if I see too much pretense or too much, uh, you know, reaching for the brass ring for, on someone's efforts, even here in the studio, you know, it's like, man, that's not punk rock, and we're not talking about the style of music punk rock. Wherever commercialism, wherever someone's trying to make a dollar on co-opting uh, this culture, uh, which is supposed to be a rebel culture, you know, uh, then it really gets hard to take. Suddenly you're working for the man, you know, and, and you're punk rock for you know, the, the big corporation somehow. I think that because we were lucky enough to come out of a, what was an actual scene, what was an actual movement, which was a kind of artistic, you know, integrity and, and edge, a kind of defying of commercialism, a kind of defying of a commercial path. I think I was, it very much formed me in my early 20s that I can make the life I want to make. I can have a bohemian existence, I can be an artist, I'm never going to be a corporate person, I'm never going to have to be part of some corporate world that I don't want to be part of. You were creating stuff, you were making your own clothes, you were ripping things, you were sewing, you were learning to play, I learned how to play the drums just because, just because the talking heads did well, I can do it too. There was a sense of total do-it-yourselfness that was so special about punk rock, you know, it was like... You can just start banging on something. Oh, then you can pick up the bass and learn three, three how to do a juice and you're gonna, And then you're going to write a song. You know, so there was a kind of ownership that was so special that, that, that has carried through, I think. You know, you're going to make your own clothes, you're going to decorate stuff, you're going to dye your own hair, you're going to cut your own hair. If you're lucky, you're going to find some cool hairdressers and maybe you're going to put them off or whatever. Um, but there was a sense of you were going to make it. You're going to make your own music, you're going to make your own records, you're going to make your own posters, you're going to put your own posters out, you're going to promote, you're going to do every, you manage, promote, you know, do everything, you know. Um, and because there was time and a different level of attention span, I think things had a chance to root and form. And then you started seeing images, and you started learning more, and then you passed around cassettes, and then you learned more. And there was a camaraderie in the music scene that I don't think really existed anywhere else. Um, where bands would, you know, put each other on bills and try to plan shows together and, and just genuinely get to know each other and hang out. It wasn't so regimented and separated and this kind of band does this, this kind of band does that, there's no interaction. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was a place where, like, art and music actually was part of the scene there. Like, people were artists, you know, people were you know, genuinely trying to do something different than music and trying to do it on their own. You know, and there was a, a, a definite work ethic where the rat was you know, definitely the CBGBs of Boston where, you know, if you worked for it, 
and you were decent, you, you could you could build a following there. You can build a fan base. I think there was a lot of all of this together back then. In many of the clubs, in many of the bands, a lot of it was because BCM could you know play a cassette and drive time. So you'd fill up the club with people with other tunes. position of this music in the music world at large and in counterculture at large because the way they were phases from the inception of punk which quickly got renamed new wave because it didn't you know whatever for that first five years or so we were convinced that it was going to be massively popular we were baffled that it wasn't um, the great irony is that you hear blitzkrieg bop at the ballpark right in between innings but I can remember going to a party at Wellesley College in 76 and finding a copy of the first Ramones album and thinking to myself, well, if I put on, like, you know, Blitzkrieg Bop or one of the other really punky songs, I know it'll clear the room because people don't like punk rock for some weird reason. However, I'm going to put on I Want to Be a Girl, Your Boyfriend, which to my mind was like a Beach Boy, boy song going to be a little bit louder and faster. And everyone would go, this is a great pop song, who is this? And I'm gonna go, ha ha ha, fooled you. It's punk rock, and punk rock's good. And I, and so I put on that song and it cleared the room. And I mean, it cleared the room instantly. Yeah, and I remember at that yeah. time, classic pop songs weren't popular anymore. Right, yeah. It was, it was, it was yeah. the, uh, the, uh, the sound like the Almond. You had to yeah. so, sound like the Almond Boy. Right, yeah. So, so neither, neither, like, the, you know, the beach, if you had put on the Beach Boys, you know, you might have cleared the room. <laughs> the yeah. yeah. The, the point was, at that moment, I was, crap, we're in trouble here. I mean, the assumption was that the Elvis in the mid-50, you know, 54, you know, without, roughly speaking, the Beatles in 64, and that punk rock was going to be the next revitalizing thing. It would become massively popular, just like the Beatles. And the first inkling, and we started to get inklings that this wasn't going to happen. So there was this intense period from 76 to, it might have lasted the better part of a decade, where A, we thought we were the only people who knew what, where the great music was, and B, we were kind of at a loss to figure out where the, why the world hadn't figured it out. Phase two was the rise of a successful college radio and, and fanzine network that made the provider support system for, 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 for indie bands. In the, 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 the rise of indie rock as we know it, and if you read the, the, the homes, the homestead record, right, right. And if you read Michael Azarud's book, um, you know, um, our band could be your life. Um, he talks about Mission of Burma being before that support system was in place. Um, but by the time you got to the second generation um, Pixies, the real the Pixies generation, Buffalo Tom, late '80s. From, there was about a five-year period there where it had changed dramatically. Now everyone realized we'll never be hugely popular. We're never gonna, you know, no one's ever gonna like this stuff, but we can survive. Then Nirvana happened, and suddenly it was hugely popular. What we thought would happen in 76 happened in 1991 with Nevermind. Suddenly, this was the music everyone was listening to. It was like, excuse me? It's, and I remember having arguments about people as to whether denying that Nirvana was punk or, you know, of course it's punk, go back, play it, play it, you know, there's been very little stylistic, there was very little stylistic evolution from 76 to 91, I mean, you know, you could have dropped Nevermind into 78, we would have thought it was great, but wouldn't have been like, we wouldn't have not known how to listen to it the way if you had taken um, the Sex Pistols and dropped it into 1965, people would have had an aneurysm, you know. I mean, it's always amazed me how much stylistic evolution there was in, in the scene, in the music, um, from the Beatles like, to early, the early punk days, and that, that insane reckless pace of, of stylistic innovation really, really settled down after we'd invented punk. I think rock and roll in the 60s, you know, changed the world politically, and then punk kind of kicked that out the door, and had a different, it had a political attitude as well. So we're all in this... Uh, 
to share the truth. And lo and behold, 30 years later, the punk thing is integrated in the mainstream of life. You know, it's haircuts and bands that, you know, sell platinum, you know, records and uh, it's all very uh, comfortable and cozy and acceptable now. Earlier this year I was in the supermarket and he was playing on the supermarket music and, and some little two-year-old girl was being wild around going, E, oh, let's go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's astonishing that what happened at the rat was legitimately so far ahead of its time that it took most people 15 years to, to be able to listen to it. Best experience we had, definitely. That last show was so special. It was absolutely packed. Everybody was there early. Uh, we had people there uh, who, one fellow who has since become a good friend, uh, showed up in a priest's outfit. He actually came to our resurrection some 14 years later dressed as a cardinal <laughs> because we figured that he would have been moved up. So if we ever do it again, he'll have to come as Pope, I suppose. The very, very last song, our encore, I threw down my guitar, jumped into the crowd, and crowd surfed from the stage holding the pipe that ran across the ceiling of the rat to keep me moving as people are passing me back, 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 all the way to the back of the room. And then I literally pointed back to the stage, to the audience, back there, I gotta go back to the stage. And they just passed me forward again, all the way back to the stage, dumped me rather unceremoniously onto the stage again, and jumped up and finished the song. Those of us who um, uh, passed the uh, initiation uh, process and were, um, you know, part of the regulars, part of the family, uh, that was important because for those who started to be attracted to the rat for, you know, the notoriety, the scene, and everything they'd been reading about, they might come in and uh, not understand the certain, you know, codes of what you could or couldn't do and uh, if you were asked to leave or do something or move something or and you gave a certain bouncer a little lip back I mean it could be nearly fatal I mean uh, some of the violence uh, was shocking um, it just seemed like uh, people who liked hurting people you know, it was almost a benefit to the job you know, I get to beat the shit out of somebody uh, for looking at me the wrong way <laughs> or something, you know. Uh, this band, who are friends of ours from Rhode Island, called Rash of Stabbings, uh, 
showed up at our doorway at, you know, 2.33 in the morning and they needed, you know, bandages and, and you know, a place to just kind of regroup because they'd just been beaten severely for probably saying some kind of stupid thing to one of the bouncers, probably trying to rush them out and get them loaded out and somebody said something stupid and next thing you know they're all broken human beings. It was, you know, it was like a pirate's den, I guess. It was, you know, um, you had to know how to carry yourself, how to read people carefully because there was, um, there was stuff in there. There were people who came because they knew there was violence. And they wanted to, you know, either be voyeurs in that process or participants too, you know. Um, it was, uh, it was a dark side, you know, that, certainly. We had a big major brawl there once and the guys came back and shot the place up after closing. Um, tried, they shot through the front door and through the little window in the front door. Um, Long story short, these guys were like celebrating their buddy getting out of jail. One of the guys walked behind the bar. Um, literally a roadhouse style bar brawl ensued. Um, we won. <laughs> we threw the guys out and uh, they came back right after we, we just literally walked out the door of the police and later told us and came back and shot the place up. So that was pretty scary. Just looking over your shoulder for about six months. Um, they all got popped and went back to jail pretty much the next few days. But you know, you're still always kind of worried about uh, you know someone who would come over, come back, and try to shoot you over a bar brawl. And I ended up playing in the balcony, You're just standing there on the floor, and there was this couple dancing in front of me. And suddenly, this guy comes up with a chair and smashes it over this guy's head. And I've got take, you know, chair legs flying past my eyeballs. This guy's on the ground bleeding. Jamie's <laughs> It was, it was, um, yeah. And Swine drove a car down the back stairs. You know, he had a beef with one of the bouncers there. And so he got the guy's car and drove it down the back stairs. The rat was was a shithole, but it was a perfect shithole. It was the shithole, uh, which made it exceptional. It's kind of gross. I, I saw a guy wash his face in urinal water. It's very typical for the rat. Yeah. I've never seen anything like that. He was hammered, and he he just put up his hand as if it were a, a sink and just started. <laughs> and uh, you know. Yeah, I remember leaving through the back door once and yeah. stepping on a rat as I walked out the door. <laughs> in the bathrooms, of course. And uh, Jimmy talks about the bathrooms are just, I mean, you know. Notorious. Oh my God. It can't, it's, they're hard to even describe. You'd only go in and, and you really had to. But even <laughs> later years, he redid them. And they didn't even last a night. He, he says, Jimmy Harrell, that the day he fixed them, that night, they were broke and it was like a mess. It didn't last. Because these people are just like, I don't know. <laughs> He's doing just a lot of other things in those bathrooms besides using yeah. them to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and they used to flood periodically. It was friendly. It was black and dirty and it stank. <laughs> but it was, it was welcoming, you know. I think the best clubs always make musicians feel good about what they're doing and that look after them, you know, without a lot of, you know, and so I, it was great. All my favorite clubs have been like that. It gave me a sense of pride to know that you, you played a gig there. It was just an honest, honest rock and roll shit box, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was just a dump, but that's all you needed. I mean, those, those are the dumps that, 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 that's where the music was. We're only in it for the money, you know. You were doing this show tonight for you people here tonight. Why? Because we love you. During the year we were at the Atmos was that there basically was one Boston Oxen. And what uh, changed that most was hardcore. Uh, that was the, the dividing line. Now, I, I went to a lot of hardcore gigs in the early years. I was I considered myself part of the scene, even though I wasn't 
really, I wasn't a very physical person, so I wasn't in the pit. <laughs> but I knew a lot of the people who were there. Um, and I went to a lot of the gigs, and then I went to places like the Media Workshop. And uh, that, for that first generation of uh, bands, they were a little bit more of the scene uh, than the bands that came later. The bands that came later were, I think, a little more separatist. Uh, they didn't interact with uh, the garage rockers. Uh, or the art punks. Or the art punks, or the, the, uh, the sort of Americana ba type bands, uh, roots rock bands, uh, like Truffy the Cat that came up. Basically, there was this fracturing into tribes. And I remember, uh, especially as the hardcore scene began to get a reputation for, for uh, things like the uh, FSU crew going out and, and enforcing uh, straight edge rules on people. Uh, that just wasn't anything that really spoke to me. So I, I basically, uh, little by little, I, I, I found myself going to less and less of those shows. My grandmother had Alzheimer's and I didn't see her for the last 10 years of her life. She, I mean, she was at home, she couldn't recognize anybody, right? That was like the rat, what the rat was. It was still there, they were still booking bands, but it wasn't the rat anymore. It was exactly like when, when an, an elderly grandparent no longer recognizes their kids. The rat didn't recognize, you know, that's what it was to my mind. To my mind, the rat had a real death. It almost seemed like a natural evolution that the, the rat's gone and the music's gone, a nice little piece of uh, underground culture was, was lost with the rat. Unwashed. And it kind of died a slow, meandering death where it just kind of just faded away. And then you hear, wow, the rat's closing. I was like, holy shit, the rat's closing? Like, that's an institution of its own. That's closing. Um, and I went to the last show. You know, it was, it was sad to see it go. People were, like, ripping doors off, like bathroom doors. And <clears throat> we had done a sculpture on the wall of all these rats swarming around. And um, all their eyes were LED lights. People were, like, ripping those off the wall and taking them. Um, people are just ripping pieces of the bar out. I, I heard the actual main bar of the Rat is somewhere in some club. Someone bought that bar. I can actually, I'm proud to say, drink the last drop of Jack Daniels out of that place, which is very apropos because uh, I drink a lot of Jack Daniels in that place. You, know, you go into Kenmore Square and there's nothing there. You know, there's it's like somebody erased a big chunk of our history. You know, there's a big yellow building that takes up the whole block and all the great little record stores and clothing stores and you know the pizza pad and Narcissus across the street and soup and salad and Charlie's cafeteria and all that is gone I mean, the, the whole reason they wanted it because they, they thought it was going to be this big money making thing where they killed all the charm of Kenmore Square there's what is there I mean, there's no reason to be in Kenmore Square mid-70s to the, to the late 80s um, seemed to be the rat on its own um, course pretty much delivering the rat you know year after year ebbs and flows to music of course you know you can't be white hot all the time but um, but you still recognized it in its basic aesthetic as you remembered from the early days now whatever happened uh, in the you know, late 80s till it closed, um, it seemed like uh, there was such a lull in musical uh, epicenter, um, you know, energy or zeitgeist 
type bands or movements that um, it kind of became either financially crippled or it just became a an apathetic sort of place to uh, just keep things moving along. Um, the bar uh, itself became uh, more of the hangout upstairs, and I remember that becoming very clicky, uh, very sort of, uh, you know, a bunch of just people just feeling important, you know, showing up there every day and talk, grousing about whatever, and it just felt very uninviting in a way. Well, this happened to a number of clubs in Boston, but there was that FSU gang that started infiltrating uh, places and and uh, whether they, you know, sort of were using them as just little sort of uh, hangout territories or they started working for some of these clubs. Uh, but it became rather uh, scary to um, think, I'm not dealing with music people anymore, I'm dealing with, with criminals, outright thugs and criminals. They have no vested interest in a cultural uh, base here. It's, it's all about just uh, um, claiming this as your own and, and fucking you up if uh, you didn't agree. He wants complete control! The center of the scene was had always been the the, the primitivo boom boom, the, the real kids really sound. Um, the nervous eaters were really a bit adjunct to that. Um, the Boston scene wouldn't have had the coherence that it had without that music being central and the other styles being being orbiting around it. You were at ground zero. Uh, you were really part of something something very, very important that was happening in music. There'll never be another rap. There'll never be that sense of that everyone else is listening to disco, everyone else is still listening to hair metal, everyone else is wrong in a real right. The thing is, times have changed, our lives have changed, so it was for the, us and that whole punk scene that was mm -hmm. there at the right time, uh, There'll never be anything like that. There is no replacement for the rat, I'd have yeah. to say, because the rat, it wasn't just a place, it was a place and a time. Yeah. And those things don't line up like that. I mean, it just they just don't. You had a guy who knew to keep the place open, I had the place and focus on what was happening at that time. And what was happening was organic. It was as he had the club, it was growing. It growed into him and he and he growed with it. He grew with it. It was a confluence of all these things that were going on so there is no replacement and it isn't because there isn't good clubs or there are better clubs there are more comfortable clubs but there's no club that exists during that nexus of energy creative energy you know punk growth all that the DIY stuff that was going on the, the radio that was happening and the Boston group of news and the, the scene was growing that's what the rap was part of that's why it was so great to me and it wasn't just the place there's all those things happen. You take all those things away, and you can have a palace. And you know, with a wonderful PA system, and wonderful yeah. you know, sit-down seats, and a wonderful meal. And that's not gonna be the Rat experience. And you can't run a club like the Rat anymore. Um, the liabilities, and the legal issues, and uh, you know, just what went on down there uh, in today's world just wouldn't happen anymore. I mean, it was, it was lawless. Uh, twenty twenty hindsight. Uh, usually offers a, a, a vastly different um, assessment of things, but in terms of the rat, it almost hasn't changed. It's uh, 
the way I feel about the rap now is the way I felt about it then. It was an integral part of my development and, and my uh, growth as a musician, a songwriter, and as a person. You know, I, I valued the fact that I could uh, carry myself in the rat and, and express myself and, and take that kind of, you know, swagger out, out into the world a little more. You know, it was, it was an educational process of urban life, of urban music, of underground uh, um, socio-political ideas. Um, uh, it was my college, literally. I can look back and cherish a lot of great uh, enriching uh, memories of friendships and, and music and uh, events and uh, some hard luck, you know, lessons too, you know, things stolen, getting beat up, uh, heartbreak of love affairs. And I really feel lucky to have been one of the people that played there and uh, I saw a bunch of great stuff and that we could give a, a floor and a couch to bands from New York and vice versa because of that place, because they wanted to play that particular club. It was like a lost and found. You could you could you could walk down those steps and get lost, or you could go down there and find and find something too. It's funny how much it formed you and shaped you, and I feel like it's very much still a presence in my life. You know, it hasn't changed really. Oh, we have left the rat. You know, but the rat hasn't left us. <laughs>